going to say the things that nobody ever wants to hear, uh, things that I can't even repeat right now, but he was very violent and he was very anti just about everybody. A beautiful woman and she's giving me that look, you know? And I'm no single bar stud, but I know what that's all about. I know what that looks about. That, bo that look is about seduction. This woman's a seductress, a temptress, a slut, scum, whore, a prostitute, hooker, call them whatever you want. They hook you into a life of VD and pestilence. And behind every one of them, there's a pimp. And those pimps aren't nice guys. Mm -mm. Walk up to you in the street, burn your eye out with a cigarette. I thought I will bring out this guy that's so negative and the audience will reject him but maybe they'll be turned on by him at the same time and they'll be stuck with the fact that they like somebody that they're not supposed to like. They'll slice you up, they'll cut you up. It was a theater of aggression. It was about really involving everybody. I mean, it was kind of like uh, taking a lot of the, the 60s and early 70s experimental theater ideas and putting them in a punk environment. The only problem was, was that ultimately it was a one one-line joke. I mean, again and again and again I would get on stage and again and again I would upset people. And I, and I realized that they just wanted more. I mean, if I had come out on stage, poured gasoline on my head and lit us a match, they would have been in ecstasy. And I said, I can't take this any further. Let's go back to Ricky for just, just a moment. Uh, was he that intellectually created? Oh, yeah. Oh, did I go through all this thought yeah. process? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, I was, uh, I was very, very steeped in uh, the conceptual art scene, the perfect performance art scene that was existing at that time in, in the late 70s in New York and Soho. I'd come out of the theater. I mean, I'd been acting since I was 14, but I'd gotten bored with a lot of what I saw in the theater. So I started hanging around all these artists, and they were doing a lot of talking about what they were doing. There was a lot of theory behind what was going on, and my friends were spending a lot of time talking about why we make what we make. Who, what is the effect we want to get? Who are some of the artists that are having that kind of effect on you? Well, um, uh, Robert Longo, Cindy Sherman, Michael Zwack, Jack Goldstein, David Sally, uh, were all making either work that was very uh, set off, like, I found this, take a look at it. Well, Longo, for example, those looks kind of violent. Yes, uh, or very violent, mm -hmm. very confrontational. Uh, saying that when you, you, your role in watching something is as important as the, as the guy who made it. And Cindy and Sherman Roberts Jane, uh, taking pictures of herself, mm -hmm. in a sense, and because it's, it's kind of what you were doing, too. Well, yeah, Cindy and I are very parallel in that um, we're looking at what, is, what makes a person be who they are. And in my first solos, I was looking at... I, I had a real problem as an actor saying, this is me, and now I'm going to go play this guy over here. I, I said, wait a minute, I'm all these people. I have a lot of people inside of me. Who are they? And that's how I started making the solos, was just looking at the kinds of people. Nobody's one person, and everybody plays roles in their life. When you go to the doctor's office and you go to see the doctor, the doctor is playing the role of being a doctor. Uh, it's especially hard for me even to sit here right now, now talking with you because I, I don't know what role I'm supposed to be playing. I'm more, I'm more comfortable when I'm making believe I'm somebody else. I mean, there's no central core of Eric Bogosian? I suppose there is, but as soon as I have any feeling of an audience, mm -hmm. I immediately try to run to one character or another. You're always I, like that? But yeah, I guess I was when I was younger. I was mm -hmm. probably, uh, I was, um, yeah, I didn't know who I was for a long time. One day, uh, they handed me some script. They said, this is Shakespeare. It's, uh, you're going to be Juliet's father. And uh, I was home free. I mean, I get to fantasize. I get to be all the people I can't be in real life. Well, I mean, actors are, are classically outsiders as kids or... Mm -hmm. not comfortable in their own skins. You need a fantasy life. You need, you, you, I mean, when I say need, I mean your fantasy life was your lifeboat. It was where you, where you went to hide away, or where I went to hide away. But I did it for years and years and years and years and years in front of a, mi a mirror in my bedroom. I never thought that it had anything to do with anything anybody would ever want from me. I never thought I'm going to be an actor someday. It was only when it came up in school that I found out you call this acting, the, uh, people like to watch it, and I'm good at it. Something that, that I thought about um, is, is that there was a certain, there's a certain comfort. You give the audience a certain comfort in the fact that almost all of these characters are either so despicable or so irredeemable or such hustlers 
that we don't ultimately have to care about them. We don't have to give the panhandler a buck. Uh, we don't have to see the humanity in Joe Sixpack. You know, none of them really require our responsibility. Well, they're only characters. Um, I think, remember, where I come from is that I'm not saying this is reality. I'm saying this is a representation. And I think it does do a lot to people, it stirs up the way they look at these people, and then they leave the theater and it will change the way they come across somebody similar to somebody I'm playing on stage. Um, I think of it sort of as the, there are a lot of disturbing things out there. We don't really know what to do with them. Uh, just like uh, when the cavemen made cave paintings, they were scared of the bear, they painted the bear, and they threw stones at them. Well, my audience is essentially here watching um, the things that scare them outside because they have the rest of the audience to sit with them and they, and they know I'm not going to come off the stage and bite them. They can, they can deal with it and think about it and, and touch it and be there for a little while. Uh, there's, a, there's an element of a thrill to that, but I think there's a humane element as well. Uh, I care, otherwise I wouldn't play the guys. Um, I'm confused. If I see a man on the street and he's, he's in rags and he's obviously out of it on, on a drug or alcohol or something, I don't know what to do. If you help a guy up for a second here, I just slipped and fell down. I was running the marathon here, but and I fell down for a second. Should I pick him up? Shouldn't I pick him up? He, he looks like he's been there for a while. Nobody else is picking up. I don't know. I know you can hear me, buddy. Don't act like you can't hear me. How about it, huh? What, you think you're better than me or something? What bothers me is my reaction. I mean, beyond even the, the horrible state the guy is in. I'm not sure what to do. If it was my, my, my brother or sister there, I would jump right down and pick him up. It's not my brother or sister, so I don't know what to do. And I think a lot of people feel that way. What are you going to do? Go home and have a nice little dinner now with the wife and the kids and the dog and the gerbil? Ah, nice little roast beef dinner there, huh? With, with, with some, some asparagus tips, huh? Gonna have some asparagus tips tonight, buddy, are you? Huh? A little asparagus tips tonight. That's why you can't pick me up, huh? Huh? You're all the same. You know that? You're a bump. You're a bunch of bumps. I'm looking at a lot of behavior in the shows that are in gray areas of morality. And there's a lot of there's a lot like that now because the moral fiber of our country is, is, is very loose and ragged at this point. I'd like to say one more thing about drugs, if I may. I, I know we're running out of time here, but, um, you know, so many of the kids, there's so many kids watching right now, and I, and I know that they, they take what we have to say very seriously. They, they, they buy the albums, they, they read the lyrics, they memorize them, they live their lives by them. And I'd just like to say this. I've done a lot of drugs. I've had a lot of good times on drugs. I've, I've learned a lot from drugs. Some of my best music has been inspired by drugs. In fact, I think it's safe to say I've had some of the best times of my life on drugs. But it doesn't mean you have to use them. Tell me about him. What we've seen is, uh, is, is, is a hypocrite. Yeah, I mean, he's trying. He's, um, he doesn't see, he's so, he's so full of himself and he's so quick to pat himself on the back, what a wonderful guy he is. He doesn't see any problems in the way he looks at the world. And I think the question for the audience, I mean, it's a funny bit, so they're spending most of the time laughing. But I think that ultimately the audience has to say, what is wrong with this picture? What would I do different if I were him? Would I be... I mean, what would you do? If you, have a, if you have a guy who's making millions of dollars a year as a rock star, who's cleaned himself off of drugs, and has now decided to help out the Amazonian Indians, I mean, what's wrong with that? Is that such a bad thing? I, I like dealing with gray areas, and I think that, it, that we are very prone to looking at things black or white. There's good guys, there's bad guys. I'm a good guy, always. Everybody's a good guy. So therefore, they're the bad guys. That absolves me of any responsibility. Well, it's a cop-out as far as I'm concerned. 
because it's so easy to just sit around and get off on placing blame, looking at other people, and never really looking at the complexities. My show is filled with a lot of negative people, but I think that there is a little bit of each of us in these characters. Perhaps you didn't see that, but I see myself in these people. I see people who are greedy and self-centered. I see people that are self-pitying. I see people that are egotistical, and I see people that are aggressive. And to some degree, everybody's like that. I mean, they've got to be. Because when I drive out in the traffic in New York City, 75% of the people out there act like lunatics behind the wheel. Everybody turns into a different person. Everybody is capable in this city of walking down the street and walking right past somebody who is, who is hurting and hurting bad. Ricky, when you were doing Ricky Paul, you had nothing to lose. Yes. Um, and now, Frank Rich of the New York Times says that you're a culture hero, that you are uh, Lenny Bruce, Woody Allen, and Bob Dylan of the 90s. Now you've got something to lose. How, how does that affect the performance, the thought process, the writing? Well, unfortunately, I've learned, and I've learned the hard way, that the safest route for me is to always do the thing that I like the most. Uh, in fact, a week before we began previews, my, my wife and I, Joanne, who directed the, the show, we said, boy, this is a really black show. This is a very dark show. What are we going to do? I mean, people aren't going to really like this. Maybe we should throw in a few funnier bits or lighter bits, which I'm f fully capable of doing. And then we said, no, this is the show we like. This is the show we'll put on. Um, you know, it's wonderful that the critics have responded the way they have. Uh, and I don't look a gift horse in, in the mouth. As far as losing things, and certainly comparing me to anybody like some of the, um, I mean, the big stars you've, you've mentioned, I mean, I'm honestly not one of them. And it's nice that people might think I'm in their company, it's very flattering. Uh, the mass media today is not the mass media it was in the early 60s or the late 60s when a folk singer or a comic with something to say could get onto the, onto the air or on a record and distribute ideas uh, to, to millions of people. Uh, it's just not that today. The, the, the mass media is not looking for segments out there. They're not saying, boy, this is great. A million people like this show. They'd say, this is terrible. We need 50 million people to like this show. Otherwise, it's a failure. Everything is compared against an absolute of Michael Jackson or um, Eddie Murphy. And unfortunately, for those artists, they are playing to a very, very, very wide audience. And there's no room in there for anything idiosyncratic or special to be said they're going to have to find a lowest common denominator, or just a common denominator. My, my stuff is special. I know it is. I'm not saying everybody should like it. I think of it as like uh, sushi. I mean, I love sushi, but not everybody loves sushi. It's special. A guy like Lenny Bruce could find his niche with some fantasy records that went out there at that time, the, the label fantasy. They went out and they found their niche. But how many records actually got sold? I mean, today they'd be considered a, a tremendous failure, and he would be gone. There's no room for mistakes. You can't just put any show up you want or find a niche audience. It's just not, not possible. Um, college students in the late 60s were very avid for every new thing. Today they're not. Uh, if somebody's going to book a show and they want a younger audience, they have to book the thing that is, you know, top of the charts, or, or, or has been appeared on Saturday Night Live. Do you Live. think you can, you can crack through as, as the I don't icon? Care. I don't think it's important. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really an issue. What's My work is what it is, and the people who come to the theater come and see it and enjoy it. Uh, in 50 years, I'll be in a box, and it'll all be forgotten. It's not that important. There is videotape. Yes, but that's just a document of a, of a live show. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be honest, I am very partial to theater. Experiences, shows that I've seen in the theater, I remember my whole life. A good show I've seen, I never forget. I mean, it's just that special. Films, they come, they go, TV shows. I mean, I'm sure there were many TV shows I've really enjoyed. I can't remember any of them. I can't remember them specifically. When people come in this theater and they, in the evening works, it's a, uh, I think it's a part of everybody's life when they leave here. Mm -hmm. And what have they left with? I mean, because it, it's clear, no matter what you say, that you're a moralist. Oh, yeah. I'm a moralist. 
I think it's important to understand that. I have very conservative elements in me, and I've, and they, and these come head to head. I mean, my my Armenian um, uh, nationality uh, background. Uh, Armenians are traditionally conservative, family-oriented people with very traditional values. But I grew up in the late 60s, and the, and the 60s are a time of expanding every horizon and every uh, being very um, breaking down barriers to changing the way we look at our life. So I'm these two people. I'm classic American growing up in the 60s, and I'm a classic uh, Armenian-American, and the two things come together, and I've got a clash of values in my life. I am a moralist, but I don't believe that, I mean, I think you get too moralistic and you end up with a kind of conservative uh, uh, jingoism that's, uh, that's part of uh, what we think of as uh, a lot of the evangelist uh, money-making priests and the right-wing NRA guys and all those kind of guys who I don't like, I don't identify with them. Well, let me tell you something, friends. We do not live in the Garden of Eden. We live right here on Earth. And some will suffer while others prosper, as it says in the Bible. I'm shocked at what I see around me in the world, and I respond. And the only way I know how to make work about this is rather to point a finger and say, that's wrong. Say, I'm confused about this. I feel two feelings at the same time. I'm attracted by it, and yet I know it's, it's bad. And I think that it, it isn't a bad idea to try to understand a little bit rather than constantly be condemning. People, it, it's just too easy, it's decadent, to spend all our time condemning all the bad people in the world and act as if we are faultless. Why? Why does everybody have a microwave oven? Because the TV set told them to buy it. <laughs> They're making a computer, man. Biggest computer they ever made, okay, in the whole history of the world. The government's building it for billions and billions of dollars. And I'll tell you something, man. They finish that computer, we're all going to be dead. Because they're going to take that computer and they're going to hook it up to all the TV sets. And they're going to reverse the TV set so they can see us in our house doing our thing. And if the computer doesn't like what it's seeing, it's going to send a message to the TV set. The TV set's gonna send a message to the microwave oven, the door's gonna pop open, and you're gonna be ashes, man. I don't expect any conclusions, and I also don't think I'm any smarter than anybody out there in terms of, um, I've got the answer, you don't let me tell you what the answer is. I mean, nothing I hate worse than is to walk into a theater and have somebody patronize me by telling me something like, you know, the theme is no nukes. Nukes are bad. I knew that before I walked in that theater. I don't need you to tell me nukes are bad. Tell me something I didn't know. Tell me nukes are good. That's at least more interesting. Then I can walk out of the theater and think about it, you know. Did you ever think about that, that nukes might be good? If we nuke the whole world, all these animals that are going extinct in the world would be able to come back to life and live. So maybe we should have nuclear war. <laughs> that, Eric could be a new, that could be a new bit. <laughs> Eric Bogosian, thanks very much. Thank you. That's the 11th hour. I'm Robert Lipside.